IMG is made up of uh, several different areas, as you can see here, content management, collaboration, endpoint management, unstructured data, and you can see data protection and backup. That's us. We're one sector of an entire group of information, or you could say data, management, and governance. Now, we're going to talk about governance and how you might attract customers that you didn't traditionally think of. When you think of backup, you may not think of governance. When you think of governance, a lot of times what we think about is the challenges that businesses face, generally speaking, around controlling their data. Well, isn't the ability to recover a control for data? And I know you think that it's all about regulatory compliance, but isn't uh, uptime and the ability to have uh, stabilization in your environment part of regulatory compliance? Now, certainly there is private laws and the such around the world. Uh, GDPR is a good example, but they vary by country and by region. So it's much more general than that. Um, data quality and hygiene, that's generally not a backup and recovery component. That's more data analytics, but the quality and hygiene can be a good uh, indicator of how good your backups and your recovery will be because through proper quality and hygiene, you can change the size and makeup of your data. If you change the size and makeup of your data, you can improve your backup and recoveries. Of course, we all know reduce costs, greater efficiency, increased security. All these things are, are part of governance. But as I said, you may not think about these and how they relate to backup and recovery. Uh, I wrote down some things here that, that the presentation today started with. Uh, volume and variety was mentioned. Uh, of course, volume and variety is, is incredible today. It's gone, as was mentioned, from a data lake to a data galaxy and beyond. Uh, it, it really is amazing the amount of data we're all generating. In fact, we're adding to it right now. This presentation is being recorded and will be stored and will be backed up. So practically everything we do, my phone is sitting beside of me, turned off, but on its own, it's generating data. I am receiving messages and emails and things that will be backed up. I don't even have to touch it. It's sitting there all on its own. Now I can do my own personal hygiene on my phone, minimize that a bit, Less of my data will be stored in the cloud. I use two different services for that. So therefore, I can manage my own phone there by doing some, uh, some not difficult, actually rather minor tweaks to my mobile device. But this is just the, the challenge that is uh, continuous. I do receive business communications, business emails on my phone. So again, this does affect businesses. It's not just about uh, personal data on your mobile devices even. Um, business continuity, dependent on data availability. What if your business is that business that was mentioned earlier where you're ordering a meal and setting at home and you've contacted a business for that meal order? If that particular service that you contact isn't available, if you can't log in, if you're having trouble with it, if the items you believe should be there aren't available, would you go to another service? Is that bad for that business if their data continuity or if their business continuity isn't there because some data component doesn't exist? Of course, we want to make sure that our businesses function, our businesses stay alive and stay readily available. So it's important to businesses that data be as expected. So data growth, 
Um, some people refer to this as elasticity uh, in the data world as well. So you may have more data on one given day or one given point in time than another given day or, or point in time. Uh, data governance is really about management of data. It's about um, not just access, but all, all over management. That includes how it's accessed. Is it immutable? Is it protected? Is it, as it was mentioned before, in rest or in, in any transmission being uh, encrypted and maintained? These are policies and procedures that every organization will have. They'll be different for each organization. They'll not be, every organization doesn't have the same level of concern. Maybe they should, but they don't all have the same level of concern. They don't all store the same types of data. Oftentimes our organizations rely on someone else to store the data. Um, I log on to a lot of different places and they use information from my Google account or they use information from my LinkedIn account or from something else. So this organization that I'm logging into doesn't even maintain my personal data and it may not even keep many of my personal preferences. Um, a good example of this is how Christmas shopping has changed. I can't just simply go to any site on any browser and do shopping for my wife. That's because my, my profile in the world has been associated with my wife. And now when I go to any site and I look up jewelry that I might buy my wife, my wife gets an ad in her Facebook account for that same piece of jewelry. So she gets a trigger that, that is a notification, that artificial intelligence engine behind is linking things and showing essentially my browsing habits to my wife. So I have to be careful in, uh, in my shopping, not to, to give away what I might be looking for my wife for Christmas. And this is all part of data management and data sharing in the background. So these policies and procedures come with, with some pretty heavy, heavy data requirements. And part of this is the internet of things. Everything sends a signal today. Everything has a, a pulse and all of that is maintained. I have security cameras on my house. They're recording every time the wind blows a branch on a tree out in front of my house. Certainly that's not an intruder, but the, the camera isn't smart enough to know that it's not just activity. Why is that recorded and how, how long does it get stored? Who needs it? So there's a lot of, of dummy data out there that gets just stored for no good reason without any really good hygiene around it. So these are the things that just add fluff to data as it grows. Uh, corporations have a bunch of that type of stuff too that doesn't really mean a lot. They in fact have petabytes of data. We have several customers, many customers really, that have petabytes of data that they are managing and maintaining. This is just too large for many backup and recovery uh, systems to, to manage, to take care of. There's just no way they can do it. Uh, there are a lot of competitors in the market, a lot of cloud competitors, in fact, that um, they're new, they're flashy, they're the, the new shiny object. Um, if any of you uh, have heard it, uh, some of your customers will be saying squirrel, and they'll be looking in that direction. And they'll be looking at other competitors competitive products. They need to look deeper. They need to see what those products can actually do and how a company might grow or their data needs might change over time and cause them to no longer, that competitor to no longer be capable of doing what we do out of the box and have done out of the box for many years. I created this um, small diagram. This is going to be um, more review 
for everyone on this call probably. But it's also something I think you can use in front of your customers. Most people think of data governance as rules and regulations. When it comes to uh, when it comes to backups and recovery, it's more about data recovery planning. So from a before incident uh, view, you're going to create some hygiene, some policies, some best practices. And of course, you need to understand and target what is a, recess, a successful recovery. This will give you a path to actually get to a data recovery plan. Uh, you need to have the actual plan itself. What are the contingencies? What, you know, for this particular incident, what actually is uh, the one, two, three options I have and which one might be right for this particular incident? Uh, define the stages within that. Who do we have to communicate to? Sometimes communications can just be internal. Sometimes communications, if there's been a breach, as, as a, for instance, have to be external as well. You have to notify people that there's been a breach. <clears throat> what is the intervention and what escalations are required? I mean, who, who needs to get that 2 a.m. call to make, this, uh, to make this plan executable? Then after you have all that, the disaster happens. Now a disaster, of course, that's a big word, but it could be anything. It doesn't mean that it is the end of the world. It's just a disaster. It could be a bug, a glitch, a failure. These could all be human created. It could be utilities or weather. It could be uh, forest fires in California. Who knows? It could be anything that prevents uh, actual day-to-day -day business. Or of course, what makes the news these days? Attacks, malware, ransomware, any kind of hack. So these disasters could be in any number of buckets. And I separated these into buckets because these may be different buckets that require different types of planning. So for step two, these different buckets might have their own individual types of contingencies. Maybe all the same, depending on the company, may be much different. So now the disasters happen. What do you do? You recover. So when you recover, you need to first understand the cause and effect. Uh, that could be very small or it could be very large. Uh, it could be simply restoring a database and off you go. That'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? It usually doesn't happen that way though. Usually there's a little bit more to that. Not only do you, uh, you know, you know the cause, but now you've got to fix the cause so the cause doesn't happen again. And then you go on with your recovery of whatever type it takes. Um, restore corporate function, but I didn't put restore corporate confidence. In step four here, when you are um, doing your assessment and planned improvements, one of the things you have to do is restore confidence. If you have customers and you have a data outage, sometimes you lose confidence in your customers and they just don't come back. Sometimes you lose confidence and you can get that back. But in any way, a way or any thoughts of this, you have to consider whether your customer confidence has been injured or and maybe your public reputation. What's happened to your public reputation as this event happened? I guess it depends on who you are. Sometimes a larger company get away with, uh, with more downtime than a smaller company. Uh, it depends on how intense your customers are. Are they using you to run their business 24 hours a day and now you've just affected their business? Or is it simply emails out for an hour and it'll be back and you're ready to go afterwards? So this is something that, that can spark a discussion with your customers. The plan here is to give you a way to talk about backup and recovery 
as an addition to what they probably have as their normal data governance plan. Most data governance plans are 100% based upon regulations. I have a regulation, so I have a commitment that I have to meet uh, based on this regulation. But a lot of times in the regulations, they just don't take into consideration data accessibility and is the data secure and protected. These are part of data governance that is often overlooked, if you will. So in summary, it's really, really, really important to consider data governance and data protection when you have personal customer data. It is probably the number one concern around maintaining personal data. You have to have it secured. You have to have it protected and you have to make sure that your customers can access what they're looking to access. Don't underestimate the role of being able to recover and recover quickly. You must be able to recover in a reasonable amount of time to maintain your reputation and your customer base. 